Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, what I'm going to do is count down 10 commands that every Linux system administrator needs to know. And regardless of where you are on your Linux journey, this list is for you. Maybe you're just starting out and you want to know what to focus your learning on. Well, like I said, this video is for you. If you're on your way to a Linux job interview and you want to brush up, it's for you. Or maybe you're just starting out with Linux in general and you want to see how the commands work or what commands are available. Well, this video is for you. So what I'm going to do is count down 10 commands, like I mentioned, and in each one, wherever relevant, I will give you a short code that'll go directly to a dedicated video that'll cover the topic in more detail. And this list will include all kinds of things from commands you could use to create files, monitor performance, and more. And well, let's get started. Let's go over my 10 commands right now. The first command every system administrator should know is the package manager for their distribution. This is the only entry on the list that varies from one person to another, since I have no way of knowing which distribution of Linux you're using. But no matter which distro you are using, you should know the package manager for your distro. Usually package managers break down into families. For example, Ubuntu is built from Debian and many distributions are built from either Ubuntu or Debian. For all of these, you'll need to learn the apt package manager. For those of you using Fedora or an enterprise Linux distro, such as Rocky or Alma Linux, you'll need to learn the DNF command. Some of you might even be running a flavor of SUSE, and if that's you, you'll need to learn the zipper command. Regardless of whether your distro uses apt, dnf, zipper, or even pacman, I have a video already on my channel that'll teach you how to use it. Again, check the links below. Next up, we have the top command. The top command is basically a system process table, and you could use it to see what's running in the background, such as how much CPU is being consumed, how much RAM is free, and so on. The table updates every three seconds, so you can leave it open to keep an eye on things. When you're finished looking at it, you can simply press Q to return to your command prompt. Among the information that you'll find within the output of the top command, you can see the uptime, so you can find out how long your system has been running for. You'll see how idle your system happens to be. You could also check how much swap your system is using, how much memory is free, like I mentioned. And the bottom part of the screen will show your process table. Now again, I have a video that covers top in more detail if you want to check it out. But before we move on to my next entry on this list, I wanted to point out a bonus command, htop. htop does exactly the same thing that the top command does. It displays a process table along with stats and gives you much of the same information. But htop does it a little bit better and it also looks better while doing it. The reason htop didn't make it on my list though is because it's not always installed by default on most distros. Sure, it's super easy to install, but on a list like this, I need to focus on commands that are built in because when you're troubleshooting a Linux server, you might not even have access to install anything at all. So if you end up relying on a secondary tool, that can backfire. Don't get me wrong, you can certainly learn htop as well, but the top command is more of a priority when you're starting out. Next up, the ps command. Similar to the top command, you could use the ps command to inspect processes, but the ps command is completely focused on processes, so you won't see much of the same information that you saw before. Unlike top, ps doesn't stay running, and it's often a better fit if you want to inspect a process more directly. The most common usage of the ps command is psaux. Using that variation, you can see an entire process table output directly to your terminal, and then it takes you right back to your command prompt. Now, what that enables you to do is also grep for processes, so if you wanted to grep for something like Nginx to filter the output, you could certainly do that. Again, I have a video on my channel already that covers this in more detail if you want to check that out. Continuing, let's take a look at the df command. Short for disk free, you could use it to take a look at how much storage you have available. The most popular variation of this command is df-h. When you execute that particular command, it's going to show you information in human readable output, for example, megabytes and gigabytes, something that we can understand more directly. There's really not all that much to the disk free or df command than this. You generally use it to find out how much disk space you have available. However, like the other entries on this list, I also have a video that covers it in more detail if you want to check it out. Continuing, I'd be remiss if I didn't include the ls command on my list. It's usually the first command that most people learn, so it's the one command on this list that the majority of you probably already know. But still, it's an essential command, so it qualifies for this list. 
The most basic usage of the ls command, or at least the most popular variation of it, is ls-l. There's different options that you can include with the ls command to customize the output. The dash l option will give you a long list, and that allows you to see things like permission strings, modification date, who owns the file, and so on. It's a very basic command, and there's really not all that much to it. Another option you could consider is the H option. So if you combine that with ls-l, it becomes ls-lh. And by adding that on, you'll see human-readable output, not unlike the previous entry on this list. That means you'll see human-readable output in terms of data sizes, like megabytes and gigabytes, which might be easier for most people to understand. Sorry to interrupt my own video, but I wanted to let you know, in addition to Linux tutorials, reviews, and guides, I also offer one-on-one -on -one consulting services. That means whether you're a student, a hobbyist, or a business owner, I'm here to help you tackle all things Linux. With over 20 years of IT experience, six books under my belt, and over 830,000 subscribers on Learn Linux TV, I've seen it all. From Linux desktop support to enterprise-level challenges, I've helped everyday people and business owners solve their toughest Linux problems. Need help setting up virtualization, managing storage, or securing your network? Maybe you're struggling with troubleshooting an issue that just doesn't make sense? Whatever your Linux needs are, I've got you covered. And when you book a session with me, you're not just getting another consultant. You're getting someone who lives and breathes Linux. Whether it's a quick question, a long-term project, or maybe you need guidance for your business, I'll help you navigate the Linux ecosystem with confidence. Let's make your next Linux project a success. Ready to get started? Head on over to the booking page on learnlinux.tv to learn more and book a session today. I look forward to working with you. And now, let's get back to the video. Next up, we have the chmod and chown commands. It might be a bit of a cheat to list two commands in one entry, but the thing is, it's really hard to discuss one without mentioning the other. Basically, you could use these commands to change ownership and tweak permissions. In a nutshell, the chown command is what you'll use to change ownership on a file or directory, and the chmod command is used to tweak what that user can do with a file once they own it. To give you a list of examples of the chown command would be its own video, because there's quite a bit you could do with it. For the most part, you're going to be changing the ownership of a file or directory, or changing the permissions. There's different permission strings and the characters mean different things, so rather than go through all of that here, I'm going to point you directly to the video that's dedicated on this subject, but I definitely wanted to make sure that the ls command was included on this list. Continuing, the next command on my list is systemctl, short for system control. The systemctl command is what you'll use to essentially interact with system services. For example, if you want to restart your web server service, you'll do that with systemctl. If you want to see whether or not your Minecraft server is running, you'll do that with systemctl as well. Basically, the way it works is you type systemctl, then a keyword, and then the name of a service, such as sshd, httpd, or whatever it is you're curious about. You could use the keyword start to start a service, restart to bounce it, and stop to have the service stop running. You could also use the status option to check if something is running or not. So if you wanted to inspect a service, you would do that with a status option. Now, if you're not really sure what systemd even is in the first place, what it is is an init system. To avoid going down a rabbit hole, I'll keep it simple for now and just summarize the init system as the main process that manages other processes on your system. Systemd does do more than just manage running services, with other tools being included in the suite that you could use to manage other aspects of your system as well. Now, this is all outside the scope of this video, so for now, just think of systemd as a suite of tools and the systemctl command as one tool in that suite. Now, sure, it's a bit more advanced than other tools on my list so far, but thankfully, it's not really hard to learn at all. And just like the other entries on my list, I have a dedicated video that'll teach you all about it. Speaking of systemd, the next command on my list is also part of that suite. The journal CTL command is a tool that you'll use most often to inspect system logs. For example, if your web server is crashing, you could check for relevant log information with the journal CTL command. Perhaps something in the logs for an app might help you troubleshoot what's going on if something isn't working right. The most basic usage of journal CTL is journal CTL U and then the name of a service. For example, if you wanted to check the status of HTTPD, you would type journal CTL U HTTPD. Another option with the journal CTL command that's worth knowing is the dash F option, which means follow mode. If you add that to the list of options, what that enables you to do is follow log output as it happens. 
And this is useful if, for example, someone's trying to log into a server and you want to find out what's going on. Maybe they're telling you that they can't log in for some reason. Then what you could do is watch the logs and as they try to log in, you'll see their problem right away. Journal CTL is definitely a very popular command nowadays, especially with all the Linux distros out there switching to systemd. So I highly recommend that you check it out. Next, let's take a quick look at one of my all-time favorite Linux commands, rsync. Short for remote sync, rsync is a file transfer utility on steroids. It enables you to copy files from one directory to another with a huge number of useful options you can use to fine tune each file transfer. For example, perhaps you want to copy your home directory to a backup directory. Using rsync, it can not only handle a file transfer like that with ease, you could also keep reusing it and each time you run it, it will only sync whatever might have been changed since the last time you ran it. And it becomes even more useful when you use your imagination. Perhaps you decide to mount a network share to your backup directory, in which case it makes it super easy to copy files to a network attached storage device. This makes it especially useful when setting up incremental backups. And one of the things that makes rsync a must learn command is due to the multitude of use cases. For example, you could use it to back up your entire file system and many administrators use rsync as their tool of choice while performing a lift and shift, which refers to the process of transferring an entire server to another platform, such as a cloud provider. However, the problem with rsync is that it can be very overwhelming for newcomers. When you look at the man page for the command, you'll see that there's a ridiculous number of options available. However, don't worry so much about that. In general, just like when you're learning any other command, you should focus only on learning the options that you'll actually use rather than waste your time trying to memorize everything. One of the most common options that you'll use with rsync is the dash A option, which enables archive mode. What that does is try and copy metadata along with the files that you sync, so that way you can retain important information such as file ownership and modification times. In addition to that, you also have the dash V option that will show you even more information during file transfers, basically verbose mode. And another option that's worth memorizing is the dry run option, dash dash dry dash run. With dry run mode enabled, rsync will simulate a file transfer, giving you a chance to see what it would do if you wanted to run it for real. In fact, the dry run option is essential because you should always test file transfers before you perform them, so that way you won't overwrite something that you didn't intend to. While using dry run, if the output looks good to you, then you can remove that option to actually perform the transfer. But like I mentioned before, rsync might take a little while to learn if you're on your own, but thankfully I have a dedicated video right here on this channel that'll guide you through learning rsync. So definitely check out that video if you wanna learn more. Finally, the grep command. The grep command is very useful as it gives you the ability to search for and manipulate text. Essentially, if you have a large text file, such as a log, but you're only interested in specific information, grep can help you narrow it down. Grep can be used either by itself or you could actually accept output from other applications as input to the grep command, which is a very common way that people use it, but you don't have to use it that way. You could actually use the grep command to target a text file directly as you're seeing right now on the screen. And what I'll do right now is also include a card for the video on the grep command that'll teach you everything about it. But the grep command is essentially one of the most useful commands because as a Linux administrator, you're going to be finding yourself looking through text files and log files all the time. And sometimes you could have thousands upon thousands of lines in that file and it would just take you all day to scroll through all of it. But if you do know a keyword of something that you're looking for or something that you think might be in the log file, then what you could do with the grep command as you're seeing on the screen right now is narrow the output down to what you're searching for. It's not a very advanced command, but it is one of those commands that you're going to use a lot. And there's our video. In this video, I gave you a list of 10 really important commands that you'll need for your Linux career or hobby. And I really hope that you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think in the comments down below about this video or anything else on my channel for that matter. Drop me a comment and also let me know if there's any commands that I should have gone over and you never know, I might make a sequel to this video. But in the meantime, definitely subscribe to Learn Linux TV for your Linux learning needs and I'll see you in the next video.